Hi everybody, welcome to a new edition of Let's Talk About Education with Antonio Corrales. As you may know, I'm an educator, an entrepreneur, and a professor at the University of Houston Creole Lake. My main goal is to introduce you to pioneers in the field of education, and to let you know about topics that you may not be aware of, but you may be interested in. Today, we have the honor to have with us Christine Ledbetter. She's a seasoned educator and an expert on lead forward and data analysis. Highly successful educator, she's gonna tell us you know, what is lead forward and how can you become a better teacher in simple terms? Thank you so much for being with us today. Yeah, I'm glad to be here today. Absolutely. It's been a long, cold, lonely winter. Little darling, it feels like years since it's been here. Here comes the sun. All right, Christine, so let's start by letting you introduce yourself to the audience and kind of letting them know, you know about yourself, your career, how do you get to where you are right now? Okay. Um, sure. I uh, started my career in Seguin. I was a classroom teacher okay. and um, did that for about 10 years, teaching mm -hmm. um, different levels of um, language arts okay. from junior high to high school. And then when I was pregnant with my youngest, I decided I was going to get out of teaching and never go back. <laughs> and so I left teaching for several years and we, and in the meantime, we moved to Galveston. Exactly. And, um, and then after my daughter started kindergarten, I decided... I was being called back into the classroom. I just, I couldn't stay away. So I went back to start teaching at Ball High School where I had the honor of teaching one of your children. <laughs> and um, so I then taught at Ball High School for the last um, five or six years. And I was the department head and um, did lots of really fun, um, engaging, exciting things with what, the teachers. Were you always in the high school level or you before you were in the elementary? I was in the junior high. The junior high, mm -hmm. okay. Junior high to high school is, is where I've worked, but yeah. I've worked with teachers at all levels and especially now at Lead Forward. Mm -hmm. um, even when I was in Seguin, I worked with the curriculum instructor mm -hmm. to um, create some vertically aligned tests and curriculum um, for the district and so that was a lot of fun you know before I left teaching the first time mm -hmm. and um, so yeah well so when I went back to um, teaching at Ball High School the tests had changed right when I left the first time the state test was the tax correct and when I came back the test was the star and the way of teaching had totally changed. Mm -hmm. And so it was very overwhelming for me at first. I felt like a first year teacher all over again. What do you, what do you mean by that for, for our folks that may be looking at us right now and they, they wonder about the changes that standardized testing um, may have brought? We have, we have viewers all over the world. So what do you mean by the, the way that it changed? Well, for, for, from a sure, teacher perspective. From a teacher perspective. So, you know, the, the tax test, students really didn't have to read and comprehend what they were reading mm -hmm. to answer the questions. Mm -hmm. It was very minimal skill, very basic. We could teach the kids strategies for success. Okay. You know, basic. you follow these one, two, three steps, and you'll pass. Correct. You write an essay, you really don't have to think. You don't really have to write anything interesting. You don't really have to use your own writing technique or really know how to be a good writer. You just have to check the boxes off the list mm -hmm. in kind of a formula mm -hmm. and you could pass tax. So there wasn't a lot of uh, in-depth you know, reading, analysis, or, you know, understanding. Right. But more like following a formula to kind of be successful. Exactly, and it was not timed. Okay. Right, so that was another they big thing. Day, yeah. uh, it wasn't timed, so students who, who maybe had um, a hard time with their fluency, with their reading, you know, rate. It didn't really matter because you could take all day if you needed to. Um, so then when the STAR came about, um, the STAR test, especially in, in language arts, it, first of all, it was timed, so then that reading fluency became an issue. Students who were struggling readers, they now had to read in a certain amount of time, and that was the first big hurdle for, for students. That was the first shock. Right, and especially at secondary, you know, teachers don't really focus on reading fluency. That's more of an elementary, um, you know, when you're teaching students to read, and so secondary teachers all of a sudden were needing to help kids become better readers. And do you think that that's, that happened in secondary education because of the scheduling? I mean, the 45, they only have 45 minutes with the kiddos instead of, you know, sometimes in the elementary uh, where they may have two hours or do you think that that's a factor in there or it's just the, the way that we used to do business? That is a factor, but it is also the way we do the business. Unfortunately, like in Texas, mm -hmm. you know, if it's not tested, it doesn't count correct, a lot correct, of times. Correct. And um, so there just wasn't a, you know, even though fluency was one of the standards in junior high, mm -hmm. 
it wasn't necessarily anything people focused on because it wasn't tested. Correct. Um, you know, and that doesn't mean that teachers were doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, the pressure that, that teachers are, are put under. Correct. Um, and so, so anyway, so, so the STAR came about, first of all, it's tested, but second of all, it is a more difficult test. Students actually have to comprehend what they're reading and they have to answer questions that they just can't go back into the passage and point to the answer. They Correct. have to actually think. Which you used to see, for, for our folks out there who are watching us right now, mm -hmm. instead of Texas went from a uh, standard testing called TAX to a standard testing called STAR. And basically what we're discussing here is that the, level, the rigor of the test uh, went, you know, went way beyond what we expect in terms of expectations and, and difficulty levels. Right, you know. yes. So, so I didn't let you finish your story. Oh, so, okay. so, okay, so you went so, to the class on? Yes, so I, so I started back at Ball High and it's a whole new, I was very overwhelmed because I realized, you know, the way that I did before, that I taught before was really gonna have to change. Okay. Um, and so we actually had a, a consultant from Lee Ford, my colleague now, who was our consultant, who came in about in October and, um, she, and the joke is she looked at me and she said, oh, you don't look good. And I said, oh, I am not good. This is hard. And I'm like a first year teacher. And so she really helped me and we fostered a friendship. And so then over time, you know, um, we just, I kind of started, you know, she would email me and ask me to look over some things or, you know, we just kind of fostered this professional relationship. relationship. Yeah. And um, then she started saying, you know, I really think that Lead Forward needs your skills. I would really love to bring you on board. And so oh, um, awesome. last year I made the difficult decision to leave the classroom because I did love the classroom and I love my students. And, um, but I did feel like with Lead Forward, you know, I believed in, what they were helping teachers to do, which I know we're going to get into yeah, yeah, yeah. later, but um, it's not a formula, it's not a checklist, it's it's having kids become better readers and writers, and so I believed in it, and I said, you know, if I can make an impact and help teachers become better teachers and have a more engaging classroom, then I think that's maybe where my calling has taken me now out of the classroom and, and with Lee Ford. So now I'm with Lee Ford, and I'm, I'm traveling the state of Texas, um, training English language arts teachers, you know, helping their students to become better readers and writers. That is fantastic. Yeah. Well, one of the, um, and your experience is as a teacher, but one of the, the most scary um, things for, for teachers could be, um, you know, understanding data. Right. And, uh, and, 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 you know, sometimes, you know, I'm in schools all the time like you are, and, and I see a lot of, lack, first of all, lack of knowledge in regards yes. to accountability system. You know, how are you going to be evaluated? So that's the first fear right. that you can feel. And the other thing is, you know, literally, you know, hesitation towards data, towards I mean, what, what the numbers mean. Um, and so can you elaborate, you know, uh, what do you think, you know, uh, can help teachers break that fear in regards to data? Um, based on your experience and, and the role that you have now. In sure, that sure. Um, well, I was kind of a data nerd when oh. I was <laughs> when I was a teacher, but I used the data cautiously. I feel like data gives us the big picture, mm -hmm. and I feel like it's a good place to start. Mm -hmm. But there is so much data that I think it's it's overwhelming mm -hmm. for teachers, like you said. And um, you know what I had to get past was sometimes. You know, there's an, your administrators come in and they are responsible for all the data for everything. And so they want you to look at all the data for everything. Mm -hmm. And really, that's a small piece of the pie. And I do think it's important to understand, you know, where your campus is and where mm -hmm. your campus has been and where your campus is going. But as a classroom teacher, my focus has to be on my students in my classroom. And that's a really good point because, um, you know, I'm a former school administrator and I train, train future uh, principals and superintendents. So I'm really interested in that perspective, you know, how teachers feel um, when they're basically, I mean, sort of have this expectation. And of course, you know, you and I know that it's a chain of command, you know, it comes right, from the top right. to the state. But, you know, that's really interesting. So you feel that teachers feel overwhelmed in terms of, you know, the demands of the data without yes. really explaining that what is it, yes. what is it that it mean. Yes, exactly. And, you know, I know that we would meet, you know, let's say our English team Right, and I'm looking at the, the data for the whole team, and I remember at one point I finally said, um, you know, this is great for the team, but the needs that she has in her classroom are very different than mine. I, can I, this was several years ago. Yeah, yeah. I said, can I go into the system and just pull the data for my students? Mm -hmm. And they said, well, I, mean, I, 
I guess you can. <laughs> and so that's where I, that's where I went. But, I mean, I think it's important to see as a, as a team where we all are because we work together and how can I help each other? But at the end of the day, I'm spending eight hours a day with my 150 students. Correct, and you want to evaluate what you're doing. Right, Correct. exactly. And so that's what I started doing. I started running the data on my students in my classroom, which sometimes was a very different picture than the students in your classroom. Right. And I was able to gear my some of my activities and my big picture towards the needs of my students rather than the needs of all the other students that aren't in my classroom. All right. So. That makes sense. So, so you, you, you feel, so what do, you, what do you think that teachers should do to break that fear towards data? Basically, one of the steps is you're saying, but first of all, look at your own data first. Mm -hmm. Instead of getting overwhelmed from the entire school data, they could really right. not relate to you. Right. Um, and then, I guess, getting, first of all, some teachers don't even know how to pull their own data. Right. Because they, they, they may have euphoria or other type of software. Right. Under. Um, so kind of, I guess, learning how to do it. That's first. what I would say is the most important step because I think a lot of the fear comes from the unknown. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right? Correct. And, and I saw that with my students and even with myself. And so we would, um, you know, we had our PLC time. And so I said, you know what, we need to spend a couple days just talking about what this means. Mm -hmm. And let's go into the computer lab. And, you know, I spent a bunch of time on my own trying to figure out how to pull my own data. Um, and, and then I would help the principal, um, Dr. Ricks, I would mm -hmm. help her pull the data, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. it is overwhelming. And, and so then once I understood that, I thought, you know, I need to teach the teachers what their data looks like and how to pull it for themselves. And once teachers did that and understood, and it does take a little time. You have to put some time learning how to pull out that data. Because <clears throat> every school and every state may have different systems. But the reality is that they have the data there. Right. <clears throat> and what I think teachers... Um, not that they don't understand, but that, but that teachers don't see sometimes, and, I, and I've seen this from a lead forward perspective, is that the, the administrators, as you know, mm -hmm. they are trained on what the data means sure. and how to read the data. And a lot of that is in summer training. Because that job security. <laughs> well, but I mean, so they understand what they're reading. And yeah. so then they give it to the teachers who really don't understand how to read it. And sure. I, like I said, that's where the fear comes in. It's just the unknown. And so, you know, I, I know... I, time is precious for teachers, but I do think to get over the fear of the data, if they would just, even maybe if they have PLC time, ask if they can spend some time in PLC just playing with whatever system they're using, okay. Eduforia or whatever, and understand, bring in someone who can show them the basics. You know, I don't want every single piece of data on every single tiny, th the things that are important. Let's talk about what's important to my classroom, what's important to my team. Let's figure out how to pull that, and then let's spend some time talking about that meaningful data Correct. to get past the fear. Correct. Yeah, because I think because I think you're right. I think I'll, uh, I, what I have seen in schools is they spend a lot of time disseminating the test or, you know, analyzing the questions, how the questions, the students miss the, the answer here and there. But they don't spend a lot of time, what you're saying, pulling out the data and trying to analyze it and, and learning. Right. And I think if they're familiarized with that, it's going to be easier. It's going to be I mean, right. less fearful. Yes. Yeah. Well, but in the state of Texas, we have been <clears throat> measuring the academic standard of, of, a, of, a, of a school and a DC uh, in terms of standardized testing, you know, it, for quite a while, but it has been changing throughout the years. Right. And, um, you know, I would say one, two years ago, we used to have four indexes. And now it's changing again to just, you know, the, the schools have different, um, uh, the, uh, I would say, letters, right. denominating yes. them and grading them. Um, so what can you tell us about, I mean, what, what are, can you tell us about the new system that you're, you know, obviously familiar with that because you're all over the place? And what are things that you like or what are things that you don't like and, and why? Sure, yeah. sure. Um, I actually just watched a... Um, a video, a webinar that, that our data per expert from Lead Forward, John, mm -hmm. um, did on, on Friday the 13th. So the commissioner in Texas, mm -hmm. you know, early, earlier this year, I think April 5th or something, released his final decision <clears throat> on this accountability system. And it is so confusing mm -hmm. to those of us who don't do it every day. But oh, I, right. I watched the webinar so I could, you know, be more familiar. So okay. um, the thing that I like the most about the accountability, accountability system how it's evolving this year is mm -hmm. that what I've seen is that it did evolve significantly based on stakeholder feedback. So I think okay. I think that the state is finally realizing, oh, we got to listen 
to, to the people on the ground, you know, that are actually working with the kids and working with the data. And um, so it seems like that's evolved um, so they this get year. Better. It's getting, it's, it's far from perfect. And I, and you know, I certainly don't have the, the magic, <laughs> the magic pill for what would be the best way to hold, um, schools accountable, but it seems from what I understand, um, that it's, it's changing and mm. it's not perfect, but at least it's changing and it's, it seems it's going in the right direction. It's going in the right direction. Um, w one of the things that I liked about what's coming out of this new accountability system or the, or the changes that are made is that, um, instead of always focusing on the lowest performing students, which we've always done, and then we've got these students that are middle to high performing and they just kinda, they just kinda get forgotten in the data yeah, yeah. because you know they're passing, so that's great. Yeah. The one change I've seen is that the focus now is on all students. It's, we've still got, we still have to you know, focus on our low performing students, yeah, yes, yeah. but we can't forget our high performing students because we have to take them higher. Whereas before, I don't really think that there was a benefit data-wise or accountability-wise for raising our students at the top higher. In this new system, there seems to be now. That is correct. That is correct. And that's a really important topic because you used to feel that a lot of students, like you were saying, the, the students who were passing or, or even students who were high achieving, you know, they used to be forgotten or, right. or, uh, or they weren't a priority. Right, so exactly, say, uh, exactly. Um, I also like the fact that they are measuring growth. That was the one thing I said for years when I would talk to um, the administrators. So and the growth, the index to that they used to measure before, they're going to continue doing it in this one. Mm -hmm. oh. But they're also, but before it was only um, like, let's say with English 2, right? Mm -hmm. I just, because I'm familiar with that. Yeah. We could see growth from the English 1 test to the English 2 test, but there was no growth. You couldn't measure growth on English 1. Uh, exactly, right, exactly. right. So now they've set it up to where you can measure growth oh, that's throughout fantastic. all the grades, if, if I understand that correctly that from, from what that's I understood the other day. And so I've always said that to our administrators, you know, they want to know how many kids are going to pass, how many kids are going to, well, I want to see growth because Correct. my higher level students, they're, I know they're going to pass. They've always passed. Passing wasn't an issue. I want to see growth in them. Well, exactly. Because you can, as a teacher, you, you, you deserve more merit, more, more recognition if you bring a student that is here to this point to a student who is passing before, but you just barely made him pass. Exactly. You know, not really, you're not providing a lot of growth. Exactly. To that <laughs> but also those students who are way down here and we could only get them right here, you know, and, and they were this close to passing, but we still made them grow this yeah, much. Growth, and yeah. so I, there is some recognition of that even if they don't pass, there could be some growth because some of these kids, I mean, you know, let's say if they're on a third grade level and we're trying to get them to pass the English one tax, I mean, which, which or the mean star. Which you see a lot in, believe right. it or not, we still see a lot in high school. Exactly. You know. And so I think that's the problem is it was just this pass or fail. They either pass or fail and that was all that mattered. But right. now, okay, are we seeing some growth? Because if I can grow the students some this year and grow the students some next year, I just think that it it does a lot for the student as well as the teacher in recognizing that we are growing the student. And, and, and again, that, you know, that's one of the, the biggest issues I have is that it's, the test is so high stakes, Correct. you know? Um, so, so again, I like, um, you I like, like, that, like that, that part. What, what is it that you don't like about the new system that you, or do you feel at least that it's going to be challenging? Well, things that, you know, I just, I think in the end, the pressure put on teachers and administrators because of the test. I the, think the extreme dependency of the standard yes. test. Yes. We're, we're still having a, a highly dependent system on yes. standard testing. Yes, exactly. And, and that's discouraging for a lot of people. Right, right. And, and the thing is, if you look at, and I can't comment on every single star test out yeah, there yeah. again, because my, you know, I really am. Um, Focus special, on, uh, specialized on English, English language arts. But I can tell you, I don't hate the, the star, the English language arts star test. I think that it's a lot better than the tax test because it's making students think. I mean, mm -hmm. the activities I was able to do with my students when I came back to teaching um, at Ball High, you mm -hmm. know, when it was the star test, I am actually making my students have to think, have to synthesize, have to create new thoughts. Their personal thoughts are important. Which and, is going to make their life easier in college. Yes, yeah. yes. So on that level, I don't think the STAR test is terrible. Correct. Right? Even the writing, I was able to, to help 
mold some really fabulous writers in my classroom with the star test because it wasn't just a check off, mm -hmm. tell me about frogs, I told you about frogs, three things, great, and their writing still was terrible. You, you, had, you have to be a good writer. Well, and that's, that's funny that you say that because all the research shows that there's a direct correlation between the ability of students to write and uh, increasing academic achievement. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think for, uh, we hear over and over again the, the struggles that you know, English language our teachers have making students write. Uh, have you find any, any way to increase collaboration across uh, you know, classes or curriculums to make other core subjects Right, for students, yes. because I think it's a big problem, and, and I have seen that the school, one of the methods that we apply for students to increase student performance, make sure that they write yes. at least a little bit in every class. Mm -hmm. that, exactly, and, <coughs> and I know a couple years ago, we tried to, um, to, to bring about writing across the curriculum, mm -hmm. which is so important, and again, I can tell you, as I go out, and I've done several sessions on writing across the curriculum, the main problem is fear. Right? Mm -hmm. I've got a science teacher that says, I know science, I don't know writing. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to have my kids write. And the idea is, I don't want you to teach your kids grammar. Mm -hmm. I really don't. Mm -hmm. I'm the grammar expert. Just like yeah. you don't want me to teach kids how to balance equations mm -hmm. in chemistry. <laughs> right? I mean, you certainly don't want me to do that. <laughs> but if you just have them, you know, I, I start by defining writing. What is writing? Right. It's putting your thoughts into words on paper. Correct. Period. If you can get your kids to practice putting their thoughts into words on paper, then when they come into my class, I will teach them how to take those thoughts and make them better. Correct. Even if it is the five, the last five minutes of the class, Absolutely. the last ten minutes of the class. Mm -hmm. But it's a big push that, that, that I see the schools that get better is because they really focus on writing across, across grade levels. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's the key. Yeah. And, it, and it, like I said, it doesn't have to be... Um, something that should be overwhelming to a geometry teacher. I don't want you to tell me to count off because it was an incomplete sentence. Correct. You don't have to make them write incomplete sentences. Correct. You can just have them write bullet points. Correct. You know, I just want them to practice getting their thoughts into words on paper because the more they do that, then when they come to my class, it just makes it easier to put their thoughts into words on paper. And then I say, okay, let's do that. Now let's go back and work on the grammar. Now wow. let's go back and work on the, the paragraph, the paragraph structure. Let's make your writing better in my class. But if they come to my class and they can't even put their thoughts into words on paper, I don't have anything to work with. Yeah. Well, we have, we're gonna have a lot of, um, <clears throat> this video probably is gonna be watched for a, a lot of new, brand new teachers in the profession. Uh -huh. And you've been you know, an experienced teacher and been there in the trenches for quite a while. I wanted to ask you, you know, how does, uh, effective instruction in a classroom look like? You know, how, in your opinion, how do you get to that level where you feel that, you know, when you have 40 kids or you have 30 kids or 20 or 50, mm -hmm. that you're able to, you know, to reach most of them in an effective way? Well, within 45 minutes right, or, or maybe right, to hour, exactly. yeah. Exactly. Well, you know, I definitely think all that you do has to be tied to instruction, which, mm -hmm sounds really obvious, but I've seen that that is not the case. Um, I think the, the first thing, as I, especially as I've traveled around the state of Texas, mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I've noticed is um, that a lot of the teachers struggle because they don't know their standards. Mm -hmm. They don't really know what they're supposed to teach. Um, you know, they know they're supposed to teach writing and they know that this is what they said the STAR test is testing. Right, yes. and they know they're supposed to teach, re, you know, these comprehension skills, and they know this is what the star test is teaching, but, but you've got to get in and again spend some time and mm -hmm. learn those standards. What are the kids supposed to be? What, what are you teaching them? What is the state of Texas? You know, your your teaks. Yeah, that that is a fantastic point. The the, the basically the curriculum standards, right. which is, which are most states connecting to national standards. So right. if there are pro. So first, in your opinion, is first knowing what is it that you're supposed to teach. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Because, again, when you get that data and you see that these are the standards that are going to be tested, mm -hmm. sometimes that's all you focus on. Correct. But there's a, whole, there's a whole bunch of other standards that aren't tested that are just as important. Correct. And especially in English, the, the English language arts, the way that the standards are tested especially reading comprehension, mm -hmm. is not how reading comprehension is taught. Mm -hmm. So if you're only teaching the test or you're only teaching those tested standards, you're missing out on teaching kids 
how to comprehend and how to read better. That Does that make sense? Yeah, that is fantastic. So the first step will be knowing what to teach. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes, you know, sometimes not only knowing the, the, the general state, federal standards, but also being aware of the pacing calendar. Sometimes school districts have their own right. pacing calendar. Exactly. So not being aware of that. Yes, yes. Okay. So that's where it all starts. Um, but then second, engaging activities. Mm -hmm. You know, we long point. gone are the days of the teacher sitting up and um, lecturing and the kids taking notes. That doesn't work. I don't know that it ever really worked, but, you know, especially in Texas, we yeah. didn't really ever have an accountability system that checked to see if that's all you were doing. Yeah. Now, that's the thing. With our, with our um, STAR test, yeah. especially with English, the kids have to be thinkers. Mm -hmm. And so, to me, an effective classroom looks like um, the students are engaged, um, that the teacher is doing less of the talking than the students. Correct. More of a facilitator. Than a, More than of a, a facilitator. Yeah. Now, you know, I say that all the time, and, and I remember as a teacher when, when I was told that, and I would say, well, you know what, there's just some days, there's just some information. <laughs> that you have to that you do. Just, yes. And I'm not saying that it's going to look like that every day. There are some times when I'm giving my kids new information, and, I don't, and they just have to take notes. Correct. I mean, they just have to write it down yeah. because I'm gonna because we've got all these activities coming up right. and they need notes to to write. You know, so yes, there are some times when you'll walk into my classroom or you would walk into my classroom, and I was having my kids write down some information. Correct. They because lecture, you can't yeah. get you know. But I had interactive notebooks, and so that was important. But then we would use that, we'd leverage that for activities later where they would have to go and explore and understand. Mm -hmm. You know, and and, and put, in, had, put in practice what they were learning. Exactly, and they would ha you know have questions, and I don't understand. I say, okay, first thing I want you to do is go back and let's look at our notes. Correct. Go back and let see if you can figure that out, and then come back. Which is to a me. super important skill for college, because in Absolutely. college you know, they they want to they're gonna be baby to, to to do it. What about the planning process though? There's a for for brand new teachers. Mm -hmm. um, what can they expect in terms of, of planning? Because I think there's a big misperception that some people think that, you know, you, you st uh, when you're a teacher, you start working at 8 and you finish at 3.30 and exactly. you go home. That's yeah. right. <laughs> Ooh, boy, yeah, that's wrong. Um, I think in planning, you know, you have to begin with the end in mind. Okay. Right. So um, the second part of what's an, um, or I guess the third part of what's really important is meaningful assessment. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what the next thing I would say mm -hmm. is meaningful assessment. Okay. Right. But so you know where you want the kids to end up. Mm -hmm. And so you, you know, you kind of plan backwards Correct. to teach forward. That, right. That I makes know. Sense. And mm -hmm. so um, the days of just waking up and, oh, I think I want to teach Romeo and Juliet today. I think I'm going to teach Romeo and Juliet for six weeks because I love Romeo and Juliet. You can't do that anymore. Improvisation. Right. You can't, you know, improvise anymore. Uh, I mean, not that, not that I, you know, not great that teachers ever brother. did, yeah, but yeah. you know what I'm saying. I yeah. mean, it's, it is truly. You have to have a, a relative, uh, a, a script or a roadmap. What is it that you have to accomplish? Otherwise you can get, like you said, getting your comfort zone too much as a teacher. And it's not about you. It's about the students. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and I do see so many teachers that do that, especially with English, like, oh, well, we are teaching Romeo and Juliet. And I'll say, well, go back and look at your standards. It doesn't say you have to teach Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> exactly. Right. That's not something that you, so I'm glad you want to teach that, but yeah. what are you, what skills Correct. are you teaching? What are you trying to accomplish through the teaching of Romeo and Juliet? And I know that that, I mean, and that could, could happen in other subject areas too, right? They, they focus on something that they love to teach. But we've got to begin with the end in mind. Definitely. What are the skills that you are trying to teach the kids by using and using this activity or using this novel or using this lab in science to accomplish those goals? That's and so I think as a new teacher, that's really important. And I do think it's overwhelming sometimes. But again, it takes time and then you, and you become... Um, it just becomes second nature. You know, you see the mm -hmm. needs of the kids and you see the kids growing and, and um, again, you're doing engaging activities. You're teaching interesting um, pieces of literature or interesting right. labs in science or whatever um, and the kids benefit from that, definitely. And a quick follow-up in there. Um, uh -huh. When you, for, for, again, for our new teachers, this question is basically, sorry yeah. guys, this question is basically <laughs> for our new teachers. Yeah. The, um, the beginning of, of your, when you start teaching during the school year, what about the time frame that you spend with class management though, regardless of the grade level? Right. Because uh, it, you know, 
sometimes because, because you know I know that seasoned educators sometimes forget because they have been doing it for so long it becomes an automatic thing right but it, you, you guys are successful because you know how to have class management right away right so. um, I, you know definitely when I after I had lots of experience under my belt I told my husband um, you know every start of the year you know I would say golly I'm just so exhausted and, and he said honey Every year, the first six weeks, you say that, and then it gets easier. <laughs> and so I would say, really, it takes the first six weeks mm -hmm. to establish your routines. And what I mean is, you know, think through, that's what I, I try to help new teachers and tell mm -hmm. them, think through your processes. Mm -hmm. What's going to make your life easier? You know, how do you want the kids to come in and sit down? How do you want to start your class every day? Kids like boundaries. They like routine. And if you can um, provide some kind of a structure for them where they know what's going to happen, it's going to take the whole first six weeks. I mean, you know, I've had new teachers like, well, I've been doing this for two weeks, and they still come in and don't, da-da-da. And, and I'll say, okay, <laughs> it takes six weeks for sure. You know, but you, it's just like a parent. You know, when you're wanting to teach your kid a new skill, or you're wanting to teach your kids the rules, you know, a toddler. Right. You don't just tell a toddler not to, you know, whatever touch the hot stove you know yeah, twice yeah. yeah every time they go to the hot stove you yeah, have to so it's this you know whatever your routines are um you know in my class even with little things like warm-ups we had a warm-up every single day so the kids knew when they came and sat down and the bell rang there was going to be some kind of a two to five minute activity that they needed their interactive notebooks for Right, and so then it's not the kids are just sitting there talking and waiting for me to tell them what to do, mm -hmm. right? And as they're coming in, I would say, okay, guys, get out your interactive notebooks. Remember, we've got our warm up, or the warm up is on the board. Yeah. And I'm telling them, you know, I'm not expecting them to read my mind, Correct. but they knew every day. They knew what to expect, and they feel safe. I, I promise you, they feel safe because Absolutely. they they know what to expect. Um, so it's okay for 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 new teachers to spend six weeks two to six weeks you know working on that until they master it right sometimes it, it may take me a longer now i want to i want to shift you sure, now sure. to lead forward okay because it's something that you know has become extremely popular uh in the state of texas yes uh actually it's a tool that i see almost a lot of people utilizing even apps you know yes. uh, and, and so why don't you tell us a little bit about lead forward sure uh you know what is it for? Uh, how do you use it? What is it for? And you know, why are you so passionate about it? Sure. Um, so, Lead Forward is a company that started in 2010. Okay. Um, and it was started by a former educator, and he just had a passion for engaging instruction and helping teachers become better teachers um, and principals become better leaders. And really, that's what it's about. Um, we we are in over a thousand school districts in Texas wow. in some capacity. Um, Lead Forward has grown. So there are different divisions, right? Where I'm a content specialist. Mm -hmm. So we have the, you know, the math, science, social studies, English language arts content specialist mm -hmm. where we go out and just work with teachers and help them uh, with their content. Correct. Right. And so um, a lot of times it's, it's not necessarily, um, you know, I've heard teachers go, okay, well, I'm doing the Lead Forward thing. Mm -hmm. And I want to say, it's not a Lead Forward thing. It's a best practices. We are Lead Forward, but... The, the, the activities that we're teaching teachers are really just how to be a better teacher, how to have the engaging activities, how to have students become better readers and writers. Mm -hmm. And it's not like a lead forward formula. Well, and, right? and, and it's, it's funny that you say that because I, I have seen that maybe there's some misperception there because I have seen a lot um, sometimes teachers uh, and even administrators using lead forward uh, as a, I would say, not as a data tool, but almost like a, yeah, like a they, like a recipe to to do things, and I think there there there's still more stuff that they can utilize Absolutely. from before that they're not using. Absolutely, because yes, we have a data division. So there's a there is a man that goes out and he just strictly does the data, right. right? And he goes out and he helps people understand data, and we're in the systems and how to pull the data, and he's training the administrators or the leaders or the instructional coaches, right? And that's what he does. That's mm -hmm. one component. Mm -hmm. We have a whole leadership team that goes out and helps leaders become better leaders and helps the leaders. Um, facilitate planning for teachers, Correct. right? And so there's that aspect. And then the content specialists come in and work with 
the, the teachers. with the teachers. Yeah, so to think that one component is going to come in, like, you know, just the data is going to come in and your whole district is going to be Sorry, great because you yeah. understand Lead Forward data. That's not Lead Forward. That's not Lead Forward. That's not Lead Forward. There are components, different components within the company to help different parts of the district. And so certainly we can come in and help every part. We can help yeah. with the data. We can help with the leadership. We can help with the planning. We can help with the content. There's even a brand new... Um, uh, we just have a, a new employee that just came on full time and she is working strictly with new teacher development. So you've got new teachers, how to help them with classroom management, how to help them with planning, right? But it's not necessarily a lead forward prescription or a system. It's how to help teachers, new teachers figure out their systems, so right. figure out their planning. And, and if you're struggling with planning, then guess what? We have some resources to help you with planning. Mm -hmm. Right? That is fantastic. And if you need more help with your content, then we have the content people that can come help you. And have you, do you guys have seen the impact of Leaf Forward on uh, student achievement and... and, and oh, absolutely. And, okay. Absolutely. Um, within the English language arts, um, within our, again, there's that my colleague and myself, yeah. and she is focusing more now on these um, academies where she will go in and work with, with districts you know, um, an English language arts team, let's say at a high school or mm -hmm. within the district, mm -hmm. and she helps them for a year or two years or three, you know, it's, it's a system. Depending she, how much they need it. Yeah. Right. And she will come in, I don't even remember, you know, how, six times a year or something, mm -hmm. whatever it is. And, but it's, it's at certain points and she helps the teachers plan. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's not just like where I come in and do a one day training and help you become, you know, here's how you yeah, can yeah. do some things to help your teachers become, uh, or your students become better readers. Um, she is actually getting in the trenches with the teachers and helping them plan. That is fantastic. Right? And she has seen phenomenal Helping, helping schools get better. And, yes. Yes, yes. But even the trainings that I do. I mean, I, I've had um, trainings where, you know, I just go in for the one-day trainings and, and teachers' eyes are opened about comprehension strategies. Mm -hmm. And then I get these amazing emails like, oh, my gosh, my students finally understand. They finally get it. It's um, so that's the rewarding part is that I do see that I'm helping students even though I'm not in the classroom anymore. But yes, I would definitely say that um, because the focus of Lead Forward is to help teachers grow their students. Mm -hmm. It's not a, you need to follow this checklist. Yeah. If you do one, two, three, four, and five, your students will be great. Yeah. yeah. It's looking at the needs of your students. Here's some activities. Which of these activities we have, you know, at Lead Forward we have this thing called a playlist. Yeah. Right? And it's tons of engaging activities because again the needs of the students in your classroom yeah. are very different than the needs in my classroom Absolutely. and so when I go out and train I don't ever say everyone should go back to their classroom and do this activity you know I'll say here's what the students need here's four or five activities that could accomplish that goal now let me ask you this <clears throat> so when you when you work with the students you, you spend uh, so it may be that they when they hire you guys so you spend one day a week with the students, one with the teachers, or I mean, two days a week, or once a month. And how how with, does it with work? What, what are you talking about? With, with the schools that they, they tell you that they the need academy. Your, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, every school does it differently. I believe, mm. um, like I said, with our academy, I think my colleague goes in maybe six times a year. Okay. Right. Okay. But so she and and she will come back to to do classroom visits. She walk does classroom walkthroughs to help the teachers to give them some feedback. Mm -hmm. You know, so that way, that way they have that check. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a follow up on that. What, what are, in your opinion, what are the best ways to learn about Leap Forward and ultimately, you know, impact academic kind of performance? Sure. So. Well, um, we have a great website, leapforward.com. Mm -hmm. um, L e a d, the number four, w a r d dot com. We have a wonderful app um, to right. download. Um, lots of free resources. I think um, the owner of our company is. Um, he wants everybody to be to, to have many of these resources available to them because his goal is to have better classrooms. I was going to tell you that because a lot of the resources available in Leap Forward are free. Yes, and people, they are. People, some people, people don't, don't that. realize that. Yeah. Yes, they should go check out our um, our website because there's tons of great resources on data, on. Um, Engaging activities. We do again, um, you know. Then we do have the paid trainings where we will come absolutely. in at a paid academies, um, you know, because we are a business. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. but um, but I do. I, I just the the heart of the owner of our company is really in 
in teaching. I mean, I can say that. He is not just, how can we make the most money off of all these teachers? It is truly, I want to make a difference. I want to make a difference in the classroom. I want teachers to be able to teach better. I want students to be able to learn better. And so um, um, he has some amazing vision on how to do that and how to make classrooms engaging and, and how to bring our classrooms into the 21st century. Um, and listening to him is, is very um, inspiring. Um, so if somebody wants to contact you for Lead Forward, uh, basically going to the webpage mm -hmm. and, and that there they have the information how to, yes, how to reach the, you out. Yes, everybody, all the crew is on there and what everybody does and our email addresses are on there. Awesome. Um, for, yes, for anything you would need. So, yeah. Well, Christian, thank you one more time for yeah, being with us today. This fun. You thank know, you. Yeah, folks out there, remember that we have this video and many others on Antonio Corrales' YouTube channel. Um, let's talk about education with Antonio Corrales and Stalin Evaluation Assessment.com. Uh, please help somebody today and see you next time. Thank you.